Good morning. A very warm welcome to all of you, all friends, and some new. Those of you who've gotten used to Eben's erudition and wit, I'm sorry you're stuck with me now. Don't worry, I advise you some patience. He's in the room as you see, and I promise you'll get your fair share. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Mishi Chaudhary. I am the professor of nothing and the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center. Every year, we gather here to talk about free and open source software and law stuff. But it's not always just law stuff, because there's a lot of facts. It's a lot of community, it's a lot of industry, because that's how we all work together. We're in the midst of a lot of things, and it's the right time to be in the midst of everything. Eben and I planned this conference kind of late, in the early part of summer, because he's writing his magnum opus during his sabbatical. You will soon see that book, and that's what he's busy with. We talked to our program committee, to whom we are, as usual, extremely grateful. I would love for you to see them all, because if the program is not interesting, you would know who to blame. Can you all wave? But this, don't be threatened. This is just all friends out here. Thank you. Thank you for all your work and all your support. Um, we've, we figured out, with the help of our program committee, what we wanted to use this day and this time for. Uh, we wanted to talk about the extraordinary influence that cars are having on the way software is made and used around the world. We wanted to talk about why there is consensus that AI and machine learning are free and open source software-based activities. We have some interesting ideas about how licenses are evolving these days, free, open, not open, not free, everything. So we went and organized this, and look where we are, it's a full day. We have a broader consensus than we expected to have, because we didn't expect to be welcoming Microsoft in its all-in on open source form this year. But here we are. We knew it would happen someday, but didn't know it would be this year. Thanks to OIN and Keith Bergelt, who brought Microsoft in. Then there are some small corporate news about IBM and Red Hat. So we have enormous changes in the industry to discuss. Like every year, we have people who work around FOSS, and then some who may not work in the industry, but apply those ideas to larger issues of politics and everyday life. You will hear from Julia Angwin later in the morning. We are going to put up this law stuff, put a bunch of reality around us, expand it to the larger world of politics and journalism, put context around everything, and we are going to present some ideas about what is happening right now and what that means for our future. Given the extraordinarily well-informed audience I see before me, I'm also sure this would be interacting, energizing, and a little bit of confrontational or fun for all of us. To begin this extremely interesting day, we have the omnipresent Google. It is my great pleasure to introduce Max. Max Sills manages the legal team doing open source licensing and compliance at Alphabet, okay. <laughs> Setting open source policy across the company and managing business relationships and corporate structures for some of Alphabet's most important open source projects. He and his team are writing a case book on open source legal issues. Max is a technical committee member of the OIN and a legal committee member of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and the Node.js Foundation. He advised on open source issues related to the Oracle v litiga Google litigation, was a deal lead for the partnership that brought the Kotlin programming language to Android, and worked on machine learning for patents.google.com. Max earned his Doctor of Law at Vanderbilt University Law School and his BA in Mathematics and Cognitive Science 
at Case Western Reserve University. Max is an attorney admitted to practice in the state of New York and now giving UCLE credits in the state of New York. Oh, in the state of California and giving you credit in New York. I need some more coffee and you need Max now. So welcome, Max. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm Max. Nice to see you all. I see a lot of friendly faces here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about research-based open source policy. And what does that mean? Well, when you're in a position to design IP policies for an organization, you can do a couple of things. One, the first thing you can do is just make it up. Uh, I see a lot of people just make it up. So I'm going to try to persuade you folks that there's an alternative, which is you can use the same legal tools that we've all been trained with, which is reading statutes, reading case law, and actually come from a common base of research to formulate these policies. And you'll see that actually some, some very basic stuff that you didn't even think involved legal analysis or IP policy, grubby technical details, actually um, really depend on case law. So I'm Max. Thank you, Mishy, for the uh, introduction. So we do a lot of stuff. Open source touches basically every single thing that Google does at this point. Um, we also use it to to uh, do transactions with folks because open source is an incredible deal accelerator. It can be a lot faster if you just want to get code in someone's hands to apply an open source license to it than to negotiate a full collaboration deal. So here's the problem statement of my talk, there's this tendency to mythologize how open source works. And this leads to really deep confusion, like deep confusion on the internet, where we all are, on forums, among clients, even among lawyers, about what is the correct law that applies to an open source license, how should we interpret it, how does this influence the policy we might make. And I think this leads to reading the tea leaves instead of acquiring informed knowledge. And from my perspective, it makes doing business extremely difficult, unnecessarily difficult. Because every day you're going to be doing, every day you're going to be doing a deal with a new partner and they have their own kind of uh, idiosyncratic understanding of how open source law works. This, this creates incredible friction. So he, here's the solution for just, not only for uh, IP policy design, but just for all of us in the field. We should be able to agree on what the underlying law is. And even if, we, even if we disagree on what the law is, maybe we can at least converge on how we should approach the problems. Like maybe we can um, converge on how we argue with each other. And that, that would be my hope. So Jim, I see, like, even if you don't agree with me, I would like to set the table so that we have a structured argument uh, and so we can figure out where we disagree. So one of the things we're doing to try to help this is a public open source casebook. And I'm going to take you through a couple of the cases and show you with some hypotheticals how having a common base of understanding um, can really help. So let's start with what I think are the ingredients of a good IP policy. I hope I can convince you not to just make it up. Um, you could just make it up and maybe you won't get found out. But over the long haul, this is going to lead to a lot of problems with your organization. And, it, and make, just making it up doesn't scale. So the, the first thing I'd like to do when, when making an IP policy is these kind of core concepts from law and economics. I think these are fundamental inputs to any IP policy. The first is cost-benefit analysis. And I know people hear this word all the time, and sometimes that can be a symptom of just making things up, honestly. Because you go, well, here's the cost. You just articulate something that doesn't make any sense. And then you create a benefit, and the benefit is amazing. And then, OK, so, so it can be a way to avoid thinking, which, which we want to avoid. We actually want to think through this. The second economic, law and economics principle is this idea of the cheapest cost avoider. So an organization like mine is this deep, complex web of people. And they each have their own. 
utility functions that they're trying to optimize, right? We're kind of all in competition with each other, even within an organization. So you want to figure out for compliance or for IP policy, who's the cheapest cost avoider? If there's some kind of harm that you're trying to avoid, who is best positioned within that organization to do it? And then finally, and this is kind of related, principal agent problems and monitoring costs. So for example, I'm, I just a couple months ago, we had to create an IP policy for folks that wanted to work on hackathons, right? So you have 60,000 employees, and they're very creative, and they don't care about their employment agreements. They don't care about the law. They just want to go be creative. And so the problem is, what do you do with that? Because um, you want to make them happy, but you also don't want to completely destroy your IP portfolio, right? You don't want to be licensing patents to the wrong people or in a too, too broad of a manner. So what you want to figure out in the principal agent issue is, what's the minimal amount of monitoring cost you can spend to kind of maximize, maximize the value? All right, I have to talk through this. So I like to think of it in kind of an engineering way, in that IP policies should have these things as inputs, but really at the end of the day, they need to be grounded in, in law. Um, and so you, this is kind of how I see all of our policies is, we start with the law, we try to come, with a co come up with a common understanding of what the law is. Then we have the principal agent analysis, the cost benefit analysis. And then finally, the implemented policy. And it's really important to us uh, at Google to keep these things separate, right? Because the law is evolving, the costs and the benefits of doing any particular action are evolving. But the analysis should be separated from the policy. And this is what I was saying earlier. We need a common base of understanding. So let me walk you. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Let me walk you a through a couple of uh, hypotheticals to show you how having this kind of common base of understanding in open source case law can help us make better policies. All right. And I'm just going to say these are hypotheticals, but they're informed hypotheticals. Uh, so you have a bunch of brilliant engineers, and they just invented a new compression standard. Super cool. Everyone's extremely excited about it. It can make the internet better. So to encourage adoption, your client says, hey, I don't want to just do this by ourselves. Let's work with others, because working with others is great. We all support open source. Let's, go, let's collaborate on GitHub. All right, so you're on GitHub, and let's say you're not a very careful IP policy manager. So you go, all right, I know this open source thing. I've got it down cold. I got to pick a CLA and then a project license. And then that's open source. Done, right? And then the rest is this community thing, this nebulous community thing. So you pick Apache. But then your engineers come to you and say, well, that's not enough. We have follow-up questions. First of all, what should the attribution line be at the top of source files? Should we put an author's file in there? because we're working with a lot of organizations and they say that they want credit. And then finally, can we let our collaborators merge pull requests? Can everyone just edit it together? Should we be the sole editors? And then here's what you say. You say, I don't care. Leave me alone. I'm a fancy lawyer. I don't care about this GitHub thing. I just told you, I picked the license, I'm done. So you made a mistake. Whoops, you just made IP policy, but you didn't think through it. So the, the couple of problems with, with that approach. The first is you didn't articulate the grounds for your analysis. And this happens, I think, all too commonly in open source. So the policy you just made is not scalable. Telling people, just don't worry, go do whatever you want, that's not scalable. Because the more projects you do, people are going to continue to ask the same questions. So you could have at least tried to articulate the cost-benefit analysis. Maybe you could have written that down somewhere. Or the principal agent analysis. What are the monitoring costs that you'd incur to try to get the optimal policy? And where did you want to spend that money? And then probably the worst thing is you didn't think about the case law. So let's think about some of the case law behind that little hypothetical. Um, and just for time, I'm just going to go. I'm, I'm, there's more in the book, and I encourage everyone to go read it and to send me a pull request and contribute to it. But I'm going to just go through a couple. So the first thing is just like basic 
copyright law. I want to distinguish the types of authorship in cop under copyright law from the types of works. So there's really two types of authorship fundamentally. Multiple people can own something or one person or entity can own it. And the s same with types of work. A collective work is a collection of independent copyrightable contributions versus a single work. And I, I just want to start with that because people tend to confuse and oppose like joint versus collective, which doesn't make full sense because one's a type of authorship and the other's a type of work. Okay, so let's look at this case. Is anyone familiar with this case? Has anyone seen this? This is Al Muhammad. It's a super interesting case and I encourage you to go read it. So Spike Lee directed the movie Malcolm X and he hired this expert, Al Muhammad. Now, Al Muhammad did a lot for this movie. He suggested script revisions. He worked with the actors and coached them on their acting styles, which you could argue created expressive elements that were captured on film. He translated Arab, Arabic into English. He even wrote substantial portions of the script, um, including scene directions, like the directions that people should pray, praying towards Mecca and other things. So, the movie was moderately successful, and Al Muhammad sued. And he asked for two things. The first is he said, I want to be an author. I want, to, I want the credit and I want the money that goes along with being the author of a joint work. And then the second thing he sued on was quantum merit. Now, I'm not going to talk about quantum merit, but I hope you get really freaked out by that because I don't think we talk enough about quantum merit. The concept that someone could contribute something of value to an open source project and then be owed something for the benefit that they conferred to you. I'm not going to go into that too deeply, but I want you to be freaked out about it. So let's talk about Al Muhammad. The court really got hung up on this statutory definition of joint work, specifically the word authors. And then this is the thing that kind of keeps me up. Authorship is not the same thing as making a valuable and copyrightable contribution. That is a little bit surprising. It suggests that someone could make a valuable, independently copyrightable contribution to your code base, and they might not be the author. Now, if a definitive contract is signed between parties that states who the author is, that's gonna, be, that's gonna usually be dispositive. But that's not how open source works. Even in our CLAs, we don't really talk about authorship status of our works. Something, again, an asterisk, go look at your own CLAs, because this could be an issue that you have not examined. So the court says three things. Here, here are the behaviors of an author. First, an author exercises editorial control over the final work. And co-authors make objective manifestations towards each other that you can go look up in the record that they have an intent to be co-authors. And you can't distinguish who made the fundamental contributions to the work. So under that, and I'm going to save time for questions and hopefully we can, we can have a little bit of a debate and talk to each other, but that really changes the policy now that you form, right? Because just a few minutes ago, you were just making it up. You didn't think about the case law that might inform this, but now you think, well, geez, all of these could be elements that a court would look to to, to see whether you're a joint author with your contributor or not. I mean, that author's file could be that objective manifestation that you intended other people to be authors of the work. And that's bad, because if another person was a joint author of your work, that means that they would have the independent ability to relicense it and sue others over it. That might not be what you want. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about, so I'm just giving you a little flavor of what it's like to design a policy based on uh, case research. Resolving ambiguity in open source licenses. And I'm, this, okay, this is for Dave. This is specifically for you, Dave. So, your client has spent years doing R&D, and they came up with a brilliant way to detect a type of cancer. Now, your client has a bunch of patents on detection and bioinformatics, and let's say, for the moment that these are valid patents, these are good patents. Clients want to move fast. They want to play. They want to collaborate. So they say, we have some reference source code, but it might, it might read on our patents. We'd like to put it on GitHub. They want to release the reference source code 
under the MIT license. What do you do? Client comes to you and says, is this okay? Is MIT okay? Will it affect our patent portfolio negatively? Are, are we gonna get sued? And you go, I don't know. I don't think the MIT license grants patent rights, but go ahead. When it says deal in the software with that restriction and sell, it's being colloquial. And, he, and here's why I'm, I'm having this thought. Because the MIT license doesn't include the word patent. The person who originally wrote the MIT license says it wasn't their intent to license patents. And it just feels ambiguous. If we held that the MIT license granted patents, we'd give up a lot of R&D investment. And so it can't be what it means. Now, I'm not going to make a statement. I just got to say this. I'm not going to make a statement today about what, whether or not the MIT license grants patents. But I do want to get on the same page about the rationale we used to, to have that discussion and what are appropriate arguments. I don't think these are necessarily appropriate arguments. You just made IP policy without research again. So this time, though, you did, you did a little bit better because you thought about the cost-benefit analysis. You said, all right, your client sunk a lot of money into R&D, so that's good. You don't want to hurt your client. You did a little bit of principal agent analysis. You thought of the other players in the field, their probability that they would come bring suit against you. But again, there's no common base of statute in case law. So it, if, you go, if you were to go and try to do a collaboration with another biotech company, you'd have weeks and weeks of argument, probably with their lawyers, on whether the MIT license granted a patent. And it'd be very painful. So let's just talk about the basics of, let's refresh ourselves on the basics of how to resolve ambiguity in open source contracts. And again, I don't want to tell you one thing or the other about the MIT license and patents, but I do want to get on the same page about how we should have the discussion, because I think there's a very clear analysis to do. So the first thing is, is the ambiguous term material to the contract? So if the ambiguous term was not material, we wouldn't care. Let, let's say it's material, because the right to use and sell something, that seems to be pretty material. Does the UCC or the restatement of, the, of contracts or, or something else apply? So we know that when it comes to open source licenses, mostly it's contract law, patent law, copyright law. Contract law is state-based, and I don't want to get into it too deeply, but Versada is very interesting on this line in terms of when preemption might occur. Um, and then we can look at the statutes, right? We want to start with the statutes. We don't want to start with a blog. We don't want to start with something our friend told us, because that's not valid legal reasoning. We want to start with the actual law. And the statute says, so 35 U.S.C. 261 says, patents shall have the attributes of personal property. So you go, okay. Well, I'm not sure the MIT license grants a patent or not. I know that patents have the attributes of personal property. I'm not sure whether we need to say the word patent or not for the grant to be effective, but I'm developing a base upon which I can reason. All right, so the terms of material, it's still ambiguous to me. What do we do here? And you're going to have to do something because your client's waiting. Well, the first thing you could do is try to think about contra preferentum. Do we read the license against the drafter, right? And that commonly happens. And if you just stop thinking right now, you might think that the licensor is the drafter, therefore open source licenses should be read against the people who are issuing them. That's not true. It does, there is no drafter for open source licenses because they're, they express community consensus. They're not negotiated instruments, right? They're just form licenses. If you go look at some of the case law around the contra preferentum doctrine, it's all about putting parties who were in unequal bargaining positions. It's, it's trying to be fair to the party that was put at a disadvantage. I'm not really sure that's the case. Although we could argue that, because you could, you could say that a, a big corporation, a bunch of fancy lawyers, understands the hidden arcane implications of open source licenses better than the licensee. So there's a, there's a counter argument there. All right, this is how you should be thinking. Just go read the restatement. There is a sequence of authorities, and they must be consulted in this order. First, you look at the express terms of the agreement. Then you look at the 
party's course of performance. And so there, this is, there's this cool concept of course of performance versus waiver. Then you look at the party's course of dealings. And then finally, the least important thing, the thing courts care about the very least, is trade usage. And so we're going to go over a couple cases, and then I'll, I'll wrap it so we can take some questions. But just to start thinking, where do we consider what open source foundations or other scholars say about a license? I think it can be very helpful because it can, it can help structure our reasoning. It can help give us ideas. And everyone loves reading creative scholarship, but I don't see blog post on here, right? Maybe blog post is trade usage, but we'll talk about it. Also, where should we consider what the drafters of the license said? That, I would argue, is nowhere. Because we, only, we consider the express terms of the agreement, but there's really no room when you're resolving contractual ambiguity to consider or care about what the license drafter thought. So I want to talk to you about this case, Nana Cooley. And this is, this is for the course of performance. So Nana Cooley was a Hawaiian company that made a deal with Shell to get some asphalt at a fixed price. And Shell raised the prices on them, and Nana Cooley almost went bankrupt. So they sued. They, they sued Shell and said, you have to continue to give us asphalt at the same exact price, so you're going you're gonna to drive us out of business. And Nana Cooley said, it's, it's what would be commercially reasonable. The problem is that nowhere in the actual agreement was there anything about price protection. So what do you do here? Well, you go back to the UCC and you go back to the principles of contract drafting, right? We are persuaded by a careful reading of the of the UCC, the underlying principle is to promote flexibility in commercial practices. So, course of performance shouldn't be broadly interpreted, but narrowly given the context of the parties. Okay? And so just think about that for a second. This is a really weird outcome and principle if you apply it to open source licenses, because what is a course of performance with respect to an open source license? I have no idea. Google personally, we have tens of thousands, uh, well, excuse me, no, a few thousand projects. We're the licensors to a bunch of licensees. So there are thousands of parallel courses of performance that a court could look to here. The thing is, you really want to look at how the parties interpreted and what was the narrow commercial context at the time of the license grant. So the court actually favored Nana Cooley here and uh, said, okay, the prices can be fixed. But the court said that there's also this concept of waiver that might apply, and you're not really sure which one would apply. Waiver is going to apply when people really can't tell what the meaning of the agreement is and the commercial context surrounding the agreement doesn't make sense. And let's just talk a second. This could be extremely relevant. If you give someone, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I want you to think about it. If you give someone some bioinformatics software under the MIT license, and you don't sue them over patents, are you waiving your patent rights? How about if it's the course of performance between you and other people to explicitly never seek patent relief? Can you seek it later? How about if, you're a, if you have an active licensing program? Are you now explicitly disclaiming patent rights? Should that be read in? All right, and then finally, the final case I want to talk about is on trade usage, which again is the least important, but it seems to be the first thing people point to to resolve ambiguity in open source licenses. So there's this case, Wolfie Superior Court. It's about Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Has, you guys have all seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit, great movie. It's actually based on a book. The author sold his rights to Disney. He sold an option. And he said, all right, if you make a movie, I want 5% of gross receipts. So Disney made the movie, the very famous movie. And they gave him 5% of box office tickets. And so he sued. Because he said, gross receipts doesn't mean box office tickets. It means, how about all this non-monetary 
value that you got out of all these other licensing deals. Because Disney did a couple deals with McDonald's where they would put characters in Happy Meals and then get some promotional consideration for McDonald's. So Disney definitely derived an extreme amount of value, but it wasn't gross receipts. And so here's what happened. It was remanded to the trial court because there was no evidence of the objective manifestations of the party's intent. So the court really tried hard both to examine the express text of the agreement and to go back, look at, in a narrow context, the course of dealing between the parties. It's only then that a court will even consider looking at trade usage. But one thing that, so I've been a little bit cheeky about Stack Overflow blogs, but one thing to consider is maybe these things don't mean anything with respect to trade usage, but maybe it's our consistent citation of external authorities that actually makes them trade usage. So there, there's, a, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. The more you cite to a blog, using that as your grounds of interpreting an agreement, the more you might be making that trade usage. Okay, so just, just some final notes. I just wanted to give you a flavor of what we would consider to be research-driven policy design. Public interpretations of licenses constrain behavior in the open source community. And given that there's really not a lot of litigation and it's kind of a happy-go-lucky, although extremely corporate now, space, this is important. The blog posts, the open source foundations, what they say matters, maybe not for legal reasons as I've, as I've illustrated here, but because it constrains people's behavior, it, set, it sets expectations for how to be a good person, how to behave ethically and respectfully in the community. It's important to separate community perception and belief from what the law is when you make a policy. Both are important, but we should be keeping them separate in our heads, and I think all too often they're they're getting mixed up. Okay, um, that's it. Here is some, some contact information if you want to go read through the book or email me. Uh, are there any questions? I'll, I'll get to you next. Hello. Space, yes, there we go. Um, so uh, it, I, I, I appreciate that it's a, it's a First of all, thank you for the talk, great talk. Um, I, I uh, appreciate the idea of worrying more about case law and, and, and uh, you know, uh, statutes and, and uh, measurable factual things when we're trying to set policy. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I look at what I know about copyright law and there are a large number of cases uh, putting forth this idea of a merger doctrine and this idea that, you know, functional elements of uh, software aren't really copyrightable and only the expressive elements are. And then a few years ago, there was a case, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Oracle v. Google, uh, where the Federal Circuit kind of threw the merger doctrine out the window. Um, and and I, I think specifically given the Federal Circuit's history of uh, I, I don't know if they still have a 50-50 overturn rate, but they're a little bit arbitrary in some of their decisions. Uh, and they throw out existing case law, apparently. So uh, how do you um, deal with the fact that, you know, it's not always as predictable as we would like for it to be? What a wonderful question. What's your name? Uh, Daniel. Hey, Daniel. Nice to meet you. That's a great question. Talk to Jim. He's right here. He can explain <laughs> that. Um, so, yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry, Jim. The merger doctrine is beautiful, frustrating thing. And with Oracle v. Google, in my opinion, it becomes even more complex. It really depends on what you think a creative or expressive element is versus a functional element, right? And it is true that it would be a lie to say that the law is clear, right? The law is not clear, especially with respect to the merger doctrine and, 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 and functionality versus expressive content. I would say a couple things. First. If you look at a code base of considerable size, there's going to be expressive elements in there. And I'm saying that. I mean, I hate everything about the <laughs> recasting of the merger doctrine. And even I'll, I'll say, like, no, no, no. There's going to be a ton of, ex of expressive content that's going to be protected by copyright. I'm not saying that there's only one law, right? Because there's not. And I'm not saying we can't have disagreements. I'm simply saying 
let's get on the same page first about what the cases are. Can we do that? And then about what are the standard interpretations that we advance, right? And think about it from a policy perspective when you do the, uh, when you did the cost benefit analysis, right? Because you're going to be working at a big company and you're going to have to make these IP policies. Well, if at least you started with the case law and you could iterate two or three or four possible interpretations in their probabilities, that would help you a lot, right? Because you can model something after it. So I guess my point is even when there's ambiguity, we can still come to certainty about what that ambiguity is enough to design policies around it. Uh, Dave, I saw you had your hand up. Hey. Hey, Max, thank you. Um, appreciate the invitation to, uh, to engage on, uh, on those points. So um, I was interested, and I actually like you know, the points that you made about extrinsic uh, evidence, um, but I was also interested if you're looking for sort of like principles around community discussions, community expectations that have been set, if you go back through you know, the discussions over the past couple decades, um, you know, a lot of that conversation has take place, taken place on mail lists, you know, yeah. such as license discuss, license mm -hmm. review. Um, the reason why I like, you know, sort of the points that you made around following precedent, if you will, um, is that you know, I don't think, I don't think that it's helpful for anyone to make a categorical statement around open source categorically precludes um, one set of IP rights or the other. You know, I think that people have looked, who have looked at open source carefully have all concluded that certainly as to copyright rights, you know, that is the basis on which many, um, many obligations and rights have been predicated, um, you know, less universally on, on patent rights. But uh, I do like the notion that in each instance there are, there are use cases that uh, inform how a hypothetical fact finder might, you know, sort of arrive at a conclusion one way or another based on the behavior of the parties, based on expectations set in that particular type of context. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, as, as to the larger picture, the reason why uh, I have spoken about this issue in, in a couple different places is because I'm looking for a way for open source and other collaborative approaches to work well together. Okay, and those other approaches are things outside of software collaboration in the open source sense. It's also um, standards collaboration. And the, the and place this rubs together specifically in, in the area of FRANT. Right. You know, right. so, you know, that's, you know, and we're not even getting to the topic, you know, that can also be interesting around things like implied patent licenses, um, estoppel, exhaustion, and those are going to be very rich areas for discussion as well. I know that you don't necessarily want to sort of open those pieces up, but those are, to me, those are oftentimes jurisdiction specific, fact specific, and sometimes the law is still moving in those areas. So, um, but coming back to, I think, the points that you wanted to make, uh, looking at these extrinsic factors as to the expectations that have been set, um, those do seem like relevant points, but, you know, to stay away from sort of categorical statements in this area, I think is perhaps helpful to um, you know, all the informed parties. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dave. <clears throat> I think you bring up a lot of good points. Uh, the first, so when you say avoiding categorical statements, I'm kind of opening up a Pandora's box here because open source has worked for a lot of years. It's created tons of value for all of us and it's worked even though we haven't really thought too deeply about it. I mean, we've thought deeply about it, but courts have not thought that deeply about it. And so a problem I'm worried about is if we start creating or exfiltrating the ambiguities in licenses, exfiltrating exhaustion, implied licensing, that could be fun for lawyers to do, but are we destroying the value of something that has kind of worked in a self-sufficient manner without us? for a long, long time. I mean, and you, you see this specifically with the Linux kernel maintainers, right? Famously hate lawyers, very disrespectful, <laughs> but very smart people. And, and what they continue to do time over time is anytime someone tries to introduce an ambiguity, for example, into how the GPL might be interpreted, they kind of just wipe the slate clean and say, no, we're gonna, we're gonna make it very clear. 
that this is how we want our community to operate. So I guess what I'm hoping for, just to your first point there is, can we start discussing open source licenses on a common basis of fact and research, while at the same time preserving the core thing, which is that communities just want to share software. And we don't want to be doing anything to get in their way, right? Um, to, your, uh, to your other point, <laughs> in terms of like, you don't want to make categorical, categorical statements, yeah, it's tough. It's tough because the client just needs to do something and you just want to be able to give them clear advice. And the thing that they want to do is share code with each other, right? And so to be a good advisor at the end of the day, you're probably going to have to come some, to some kind of answer that will facilitate that. I guess, I guess I'd say, can we have two brains about it? In one side of our brain, can we problematize it? Can we do the research? Can we argue with each other based on the law? And then, in the other, and then completely in a contradictory manner, can we still talk clearly to our clients and say, Go have fun, go collaborate, because this is driving so much value. I don't know. That, that's, that's my hope. I think I got a little more, a little more time. Is there any other? It's we're winding up. Oh, okay. Let me take one more question. Please. So I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your own copyright ownership piece of, of what you're talking about. And specifically, um, you didn't, you've been focusing really on United States law. But we know that if a work is created abroad, you, you know, in the United States even, we will look to foreign laws. Does that make this even more complicated from your point of view? And then the second part of that is um, Al-Hamoud, which is the case you relied on, and the more recent cases in that line all involve places where we don't have a contract. So the whole point of that case was, we don't know what to do. We've got to figure out how to get the rights to the studio, because otherwise everything falls apart. Casa 16 is the same. Garcia is the same. Yes. So is the solution here that the licenses just need to be explicit, and then we don't have to worry so much about what the background law is doing. So that makes it more of a let's get out of our own way kind of situation. Wow, great points. What, what's your name? Joshua Simmons. Thanks, Joshua. Um, all right, let me take that last point first. First, don't write new open source licenses. Please stop. That is going to, I mean, I, I had some slides on like numerous clauses. And the beauty of open source being that there's actually a limited menu of options that most people converge on. Um, but I'll leave that to later panelists, because I know we're going to be talking about the comments clause and other things a little bit later. Um, I would say don't touch licenses. Instead, you're absolutely right. If we had explicit contracts stating what we wanted the copyright ownership to be up front, that would solve it. So what I'm saying is go back and read your CLAs. Because your contributor license agreements are probably insufficient. You probably have an articulated policy objective that is not getting met. And then also, let's re-examine developer certificates of origin under this framework. I know developers, there's, developers tend to prefer things that are fast, easy, don't have a lot of legal ease. So there's a lot of pushback. But if you actually look at the case law, I think, yeah, the thing that solves this, the copyright problem is, an express understanding between the parties. So I'd say no license proliferation, but let's go back and look at our contributor license agreements. As to the foreign law issue, it's so incredibly complex. I mean, there's moral rights in Europe, database rights, privacy rights that are strange and different from our own. Um, but you're absolutely right. I gave this, I'm giving this presentation just as a start under US law. I, it would be so great if we could agree on what the cases are in the US. Let's start there. I, I, that's what I'd say, but definitely want to focus on global cases as well. So, yes, and Evan always taught me that licenses are the constitutions for the projects. So you can talk to also the clients and uh, the lawyers for the projects. For me, it's always just go to the next room and ask Evan and all <laughs> these questions. <laughs> but those services are available. And we, um, what I learned mostly is to talking to the projects and what they intended when they chose a license always helps to put the context around the law stuff. But thank you so much. Sure. This has been very good and very interesting, and I'm sure that there would be follow-up questions. And uh, we'll have a coffee break, and we'll discuss that. And thank you, Max, for Great. making this. Thanks very much.